I'm here. I'm happier than ever. Um, I feel much more stable. And with all the resources I have now, I'm just ready to be my best self. And listen, you, you need to tell your story how you want to tell it when you want to tell it. And let me tell you something. We're so happy that you're here. Everyone listening, thank we're thankful for you to be here. I'm not saying on the show. I'm saying on the planet. Welcome back to Off the Cuff. I'm your host, Danny Lil Priori, and today I'm joined by model, mental health advocate, businesswoman, Tanae White. Tanae, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. I mean, you're here, so we're, we're having a conversation. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's one of those it's one of those things, too. It's like um, when I saw you were coming on the show, um, I have a friend who did uh, Sports Illustrated as well, uh, Camille Kostic. I, I don't know if you yes, know her. Awesome. Oh. yeah yeah Camille's super cool uh she did a couple podcasts with us back in the day but yeah so what I want to jump into is all right so you were born in Baltimore right yes and then how I'm, old are you how old are you when you moved from Baltimore uh to, yeah. to uh to Connecticut I was five you were five okay do you have it like any memories of Baltimore though because I always feel like like around five years old I started like remembering stuff yeah, I have tons of memories because my family is all, all my extended family is in Baltimore and further south, very much still connected to it, even when I was raised in Connecticut. Okay. Do they say like, D <laughs> ye? how did I know that was coming? <laughs> you guys got to know what else do. I was like, yeah, I remember, every time I go to Baltimore, like I had a kid on a travel basketball team with me. And he was from Baltimore and he's like, you know, it's like, this is what, you know, we got to go out there and just do what we need to do. And I would just be like, yo, you good, bro. I was like, what the fuck is that? Between Philadelphia and like South Jersey, like the O's, like Philadelphia, mm -hmm. crazy conversations going on down there. I would say Jersey accents are much more intense than Baltimore. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And then it's like, you know, people watch like three episodes of The Wire and think everyone talks like that. Exactly. Yeah. No, for my family, I would say that the slight twang is there, but it's not as intense because they're in Baltimore County, which is a bit more different than the city, um, but still Baltimore all the same. So like, you know, in terms of like, you know, Baltimore, Maryland, and then uh, Southington, is it? Mm -hmm. Southington, Connecticut? Culture shock. Yes? No? Extreme, actually. That's <laughs> um, actually one of the reasons I think co that contributed to my depression actually that changed from being the the one of many the only white teachers or white people I ever really saw were my kindergarten teachers to then being the only black person and never even being in a town where I've seen so many non-blacks in my life um, definitely a culture shock um, I don't think my parents realized it how much of a culture shock it would be and affect my mental health um, even I didn't realize what was going on until, you know, me being an adult and really realizing like the effects that it played on how I saw myself, my self-esteem and all that. Um, but regardless of the bad, I still am very grateful for Connecticut because it taught me so much. I don't think I would be nearly as ambitious if I didn't, if I wasn't raised in an environment where I felt like I had to push myself that hard, you know, so very thankful. Kind of similar uh, growing up is I moved to a town in South Jersey called Avalon, New Jersey. And uh, my brother and I were uh, the only people of any kind of color in the school. So they were like, oh, who are these Puerto Rican kids? Yeah. And, you know, and it, it, it was tough for us because, you know, they called us a lot of names. I'm sure that you got called a lot of names. Chil Here's one thing about children. Love them. Pieces of shit, though. They're so <laughs> fucking mean. Agreed. Agreed. They're they so don't. fucking mean. And they don't care. <laughs> no, no one's hurt my feelings more than a child. Same, same. I will never, you have, you couldn't even pay me to go back and relive middle school. Oh my gosh. This is just no filter. You know how many like times I would see like a niece, like in a nephew. And the, the first thing they'll say to me is like, Oh, like you got fat. <laughs> I'm like, damn, bro. I'm bringing all these fucking Christmas presents back to the truck. Fuck you guys. <laughs> This shit is a wrap. Yeah. You know, how'd you deal like in, in your situation? How'd you deal with that stuff? Did you tell your parents a lot about what was going on? Were your parents kind of like, you know, because now you, when you're outnumbered, it's hard to go to the principal's office. Right. You know what I mean? 
yeah it's it's like oh yeah you know so and so called my daughter this and they're like well you know they're just kids and you know i think we give them the excuse of being just kids but a lot of this stuff starts in like you know in households they learned it somewhere right exactly um i think for me i don't think i felt safe going to any adult because me being the only black person for the majority of my school time through grade school I was the only person, not even a, like a black teacher, you know? So like yeah. even sometimes the teacher would say these slightly racially off comments. Yeah. Like for example, like I was raised in Southington, which is a very wealthy middle-class town, but our school participated in the program where you, you know, you can bust in inner city students so they can have a better education. So a lot of times they would assume I'm from Hartford which is probably one of the more dangerous cities of the state mm-hmm. and assume that I was bust in. So they would ask questions like that, or they would maybe undermine my intelligence and I'd come back with the answer and they'd be like, Oh, okay. Like, yeah, I, I can read, you know, <laughs> like um, you were a scholar. They thought you were a scholarship kid. Exactly. I sort of had to prove myself every, every which way. And so when my parents, when I would come home and my parents would ask me, you know, how was school? I would just keep it as short and simple as possible. Fine. It was fine. I didn't really want to, I had gone through so much trauma during the school day. I didn't want to relive it, talking about it at home, you know? Do do you uh, wish, do you wish, do you wish you were more like transparent with your parents about what was going on? Definitely. I think if they knew some of the things that were said to me by students and teachers, they probably would have definitely got me into therapy sooner. Probably would have more seriously considered transferring schools for me because I begged them for years. I want to go back to Maryland, please, please, please. Okay, if we can't go back to Maryland, what about like another neighboring town, boarding school, anywhere, please? You know. Right. Uh, so definitely, hindsight, of course, is always twenty twenty. For sure, and and you know, I know what it is. It's like um, when you're a kid, you kind of think everything's your fault. You know. Yes sometimes and then you see whatever you know trials and tribulations your parents are going through and you don't want to add to that and uh you know it becomes it becomes something that you know we all have things when we were kids that we didn't want to tell people one because we're we're afraid and then two it's also like uh nobody's really going to care about like what i really have to say because i'm like because i'm like 11 years old exactly and i was a very shy kid too so i think that played a large part too yeah so like you know but but your parents didn't like didn't have money growing up right no not not with that my dad's from the bronx i mean all right yeah 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 yeah. in inner city baltimore um very much similar so for them even both of them you know went on to grad school to college um both went to hbcus do extremely well for themselves um i grew up not needing a single thing the only thing they asked me to do was just do your best. They would, you know, not be happy if I brought home a B. A's were always the goal. You know, right. doing selling in sports was always the goal. But outside of that, I never wanted for food, electricity, hot water, nothing. So I feel very privileged. But I think in that same breath, because to them, that's all they wanted growing up. Fast forward to me and my brother having that. They're like, oh, okay, there's nothing to be sad about. There's right. nothing to complain about. There's no issues. Be grateful, you know? Um, and so, you know, now as an adult, when I have conversations with them and I start to sort of enlighten and enlighten them on things I experienced, they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, you think it was easy being called Oreo every day or worse or yeah. not sure how, where to sit on the bus because I felt like my skin color was, you know, deterring anybody from wanting to be my friends or even with my hairstyles, my mom would do my hair and she would do these beautiful hairstyles with barrettes and stuff. And the yeah. kids would love them, but I always felt like I was a, a spectacle, you know, like, oh, right. look at her, poke, poke, poke type of thing. I, I just how, to how, how many white girls asked to touch your hair? Oh, <laughs> at least 10 times a day, every day. Up until now, I'm 30 years old now. I still get it. Still. No. Yes. Matter of fact, now when I have my Afro out, people don't even ask. They just. So like, I'm always on guard when I have my. No afro way. Out. I swear to you, I actually have a police report. <laughs> it's on my fridge <laughs> one one thing that uh i'm very proud of is that i've never asked to touch anyone's hair <laughs> it's kind of just a weird request if you really think about it imagine just walking up to a random person and be like hey can i touch your hair 
exactly like a, a friend of mine is like uh like this tall blonde dude and he went to japan and like everyone asked to stop and take pictures with him mm -hmm. and then i had a friend uh who's black and played basketball in china and everyone stopped to take pictures with him yeah i was like and he would text me just being like this shit is like they're making me feel like a circus freak over here it's very very strange yeah people try to touch your hair that's yeah. that's why I've heard, I've heard crazy stories i mean i i think i think in a way like like i'll give japanese chinese people kind of a pass because like i it's don't know like it's a shock for them yeah like a, a white girl yeah a white girl's <laughs> yeah like a white girl's seen a black girl before you know what i mean yeah. it's like like you know you want to be friends enough so i could touch your hair that shit is so fucking weird so both your parents went to hbcus right yeah. how'd they feel about you uh being a terp um they loved it i think for them the biggest concern was just the cost of student loans um yeah. maryland's an expensive school it sure is they helped pay for a part of my tuition but the rest i had to put on student loans and so originally the first two years i went to southern connecticut state and then i transferred okay. um and so uh just making sure that i was financially stable is probably one of the 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 top you know reasons why they were any even just a little bit hesitant about me you know going out of state but sure. i was hell-bent when I tell you, I would pray to God every night, God, the second I graduate high school, I'm out of here. Make sure it happens. I will do anything. Like I, there was no way I was going to stay in Connecticut for college for all four years. There was just no way. No, no, you can't. It, it, it's. I feel like everybody needs to get out of their comfort zone, especially at that age, because it teaches it teaches you a lot about resiliency. You know. It does. You know, it's like, hey, I'm away from my parents, and it's like, see, I didn't go. That's one of my biggest regrets is that I never went to like sleepaway college i always went to community college okay. you know you know so i like all my friends would go to like wisconsin michigan uh university of vermont maryland so i would go and visit like all these campuses you know what i mean i got fucking so hammered at a at a, du <laughs> at a duke maryland basketball oh. game so it was years ago it was when uh dj strawberry played basketball there i'm sure you don't know who that is wow. but like he played basketball there and they beat duke and college park was like going crazy yeah, and then like over to the yeah Big Ten. yeah Before, yeah when they were still in the acc and then like the i went to like a sean merriman used to play football there he, he's built a bunch of like bars there okay. and then like uh there was a point guard his name was grievous vasquez and uh he was out at the bar with us that night and uh i was going to the bathroom he was just peeing in the sink <laughs> i was like this guy's gonna be in the nba next year and this guy's just pissing in a sink good for him i feel like you're a um you're a terp by association <laughs> I'm a, uh, yeah i'm a ter i'm a terp by association to to two of my good friends uh uh are terps you know um but you know i think there's there's a weird thing about maryland right that people don't realize how diverse it actually is mm-hmm you know what I mean? Like uh, when you when you think of Baltimore and you don't live before the wire came out, nobody knew that Baltimore was was hood like that. Nobody right. knew. Everyone thought like, oh, Cal Ripken and like, oh, just Camden Yards. And like, this is nice. And, right. you know, it's Baltimore. I remember going through College Park and just being like, wow, there's a lot of different looking people here. Yeah, there is. Really you know, is. I said, I said, this is why colleges are so important because you get pushed into realizing one bit, trying to be an adult, which I had to learn way later. I think college would help me a lot with that. Um, but and you get to learn how to deal with different types of people. Yeah, I you think know? for me, um, when I moved out for college, I that's when I realized I wasn't ugly. <laughs> I know that sounds so crazy, but literally, I just always thought. I'm ugly. That's why no guy likes me. I have no one to take to prom, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, go to college and it's like, I fighting people off me like, Oh, you like me. There, there, there you go. There you go. Yeah. See, that's the thing though, too. That's the thing though, too. Right. So we're going to get into, when did you start modeling? Four years ago, four years ago. So you started, I guess that's normal. I don't know shit about modeling. I, I, I did get signed as a plus size model though. So it was whatever. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I'm in the game and shit. I got an agent, WME, you know what I'm saying? 
<laughs> it is what it is. Yes. But um, yeah, but um, when you started modeling, was this like all a culmination of obviously all of our journeys are different, right? We all have certain things that happen to us in life. Because when you were 12, you attempted to take your own life, correct? Correct. So talk to me about how much that moment resonates with everything that you do today. How much of that do you still think about? Do you still, does it still weigh on you? Is it something that you take into all of your work every day? Because, you know, if that happens, we're not even having this conversation. So, right. Yeah. You know? I think my first attempt to take my life at 12 um, was significant because not only did it remind me I don't want to be here, not not in life, but like I don't want to be in Connecticut, but also now looking back, I realized that that experience was very unique because it is sort of established the fact that like I will never be the same as anybody else. I will always be unique in a certain way not by skin color, not by hair type, not by, you know, the words that I speak, but simply because I have such a unique life experience, um, which is surrounded or the, it's uh, framed by depression. Um, And so moving into, you know, Sports Illustrated, when I, you know, tried out for the competition the first time, I think I very much embraced the fact that I'm not your normal person. I'm in aerospace, I like fashion. I have a fashion blog. I've never modeled before. This is a dream of mine. Um, You know, so here's my submission. Then year two comes around. And I think at that point, I felt more comfortable to show more of me. So it was, yes, I'm all of those things. But however, most people don't assume that a model can be depressed or suicidal or have the ideation of it. In my first year shooting with them, um, actually my second year shooting with them, they did a lot of these video series and a lot of mine were based around mental health, um, how I've contributed back to it um, and my experience with it, especially being a black person because yes. black people don't really talk about mental health in a way. It's always been a, there's either one, nothing for you to complain about or two, look to God. There's yep. no real tangible solution. Um, and so what I love is the fact that I can be one of the voices in my community to be more outspoken about it. Obviously I'm not the only, but I think it's important um, to start those conversations. And through that, I've been able to start those conversations with my family, with my parents, with my little brother, with my best friends. I feel like it's actually helped me to build bonds better because I can be so vulnerable. And I get so many DMs, even up until today, talking about how, you know, Um, They're so thankful that I've been so honest. They felt the same way. They tell me a little bit about their story too. And they just feel like they're so happy to know they're not alone. Um, So those matter to me because for for me, most of my life, I always felt alone. There's no way someone else can go through this or feel this way. And so once I finally came out of, you know, the first phase of my, my depression, which I feel like was probably the deepest, you know, between the ages of 12 and 16, um, I vowed to myself, I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure no one else feels that way. Even if I touch one person, yep. th- that my life's work will be complete. And so over time that has evolved because I did a uh, mental health advice column during college and this and that. And now I've uh, just launched Feel Good Babe, which is my mental health community for women um, that I launched last month um, nice. that I really see myself taking further than I, I ever could have imagined anything else I've done. It's also one of those things too. So there's stigmas with mental health, especially in the black community, right? Um, suicide rates. If people really saw the numbers, they I think they would be astonished, especially the people in the community. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, wow, like this is, re- this is really happening to us. Like, you know, that's one of the main uh, things is, you know, this, this show, the company that runs it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's run by two black men. You know, and, 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 you know, they, I, when we talked about collaborating, I was like, you know, we got to try and eliminate these stigmas, uh, you know, especially among black men and, 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 and women, but you know, it's, it's crazy because you get told all this stuff is right. They tell you, uh, man up, you know, uh, no, it's all right. Somebody has it worse, but people don't really understand what it's like in that moment when you're in that, listen, I suffer from bipolar. I've had severe depression 
not there's nothing worse someone could say to me is yo it'll be all right like don't worry about it yeah i'm like nah man i was like you guys weren't with me on that 11th floor when i was about to jump off that shit like you guys were not up there you know what i mean like my life was over like in my head my life it was a wrap like i was done you know and then you know you start to see all these things and you do get dms and you speak to people and like I've always said on this show, if if this show helps one person a week, I'm good. I like I don't need to get money off of this. Yeah. Like I'm chilling, you know. Like I I, I just want to help people, and I think it takes people to go through shit. And now it's just to be like, why am I going through this right now? Yes, like why? why am I, why am why am I going through this shit? And then in a way though too, I feel in a way you know um, I'm a spiritual guy, uh, but I felt like in a way I was like you know what like if we pull through this, I got to give back at least because the energy that's been put, getting put into me, I need to put back out into the universe because my parents didn't give up on me. My parents felt bad. My parents felt like it was all their fault. Did your parents kind of feel sense like that at all? Now that they know the full story. Yes. But back yeah, then, right? they didn't know because I always smiled. I always laughed. You would not know unless you're in my bedroom at night. Yeah. Jeez. You know, Mental health has become a little bit of like a clout chase game now. 1,000%. You know what I mean? And it's like, listen, like I didn't 5150 myself to like have to be dealing with like clout chasers. Like of like, if you're really going to be about it, like be about it, like try to go out there and do the best that you can to help people. I help people every day. I'm not saying that, you know, people aren't doing the right thing but you're not putting in the work i used to get mad when my friends would say oh like i'm ocd like i'm so ocd yeah. i'm like we're, i'm like were you diagnosed ocd and they were like no and i was like then don't say that yeah Same you know you, yeah i was like oh i'm so bipolar i was like are you diagnosed with that like i was like do you guys know how much this shit sucks like it sucks to like deal with you know what i mean like if i don't take my medication for a day my entire body feels weird you know, like sometimes, sometimes I just forget to take my medication and like my days are like fucked up. And I'm like, listen, guys, I was like, you guys don't want this shit. You know, I was like, you don't want to rock with the shit. You don't want to deal with it. Be blessed to be where you're at. Everybody's life is different. You know, everyone's, uh, you know, it's a spectrum uh, depression. Um, and I tell them all the time, like, you know, we have to be careful with the words we say because that's what the stuff that feeds the stigma of, of what we're trying to break. Very much so. And I think that um, I noticed that there is a misuse of the word depression. For sure. 100%. Yeah. Like I'm depressed. You know, I couldn't get my nails done today. Ugh, life is so hard. And it's like, okay, I understand your frustration, um, how it inconvenienced you. But baby, that is not depression. No. <laughs> that is not depression. If, if if you were depressed, you wouldn't even be thinking about getting your nails done. Right. You know, it's it's I, I try to help people define depression when people ask me what my depression feels like. I'm just it's just like numbness. Like I don't give a fuck about shit. Mm -hmm. You know, and like there'll be days where I'll be in my room for three days straight. Like my fiance, she'll come in and out and she'll see me. She'll be like, damn, you're going through it. Like, you know, like uh, I could tell. And, you know, when I have manic episodes, you know, I mean, it's like, are you single? Mm -hmm. I'm in a relationship. I'm 34. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you. So like dealing with a serious mental illness and being in, in, a, in a relationship is so fucking hard for the partner. So this is what I want people to understand is like what I go through is really, really hard. Now, imagine not being equipped to deal with it and having to deal with it. You know, my fiance didn't go to school for 12 years and study the brain. You know, she's a, she's a physical therapist. So she went and studied, you know, just, you know, she, she can help me if my back hurts. Yeah. You know, when we're feeling like that, we put that energy out into the world. It's just like people feel, they feel helpless while we feel hopeless. Yeah. So it's it spreads it's very contagious but i hate the way that people use depression without medical diagnosis because it's not helping in terms of the statistics and it's not helping in terms of their own case right so it's like listen if you're telling me you me you're depressed then we're going to go to a doctor and we're going to find out how depressed you are yeah 
we, we have to. People have to start treating depression like COVID. I agree. You know, it's like everyone got COVID and they were like, yo, I got to go get these tests. I got to go do this. I got to go do that. I'm like, but we'll sit sit in our room depressed for five days and not go see anybody. And I'm telling you, people are like, I know it's tough with insurance. I know it's tough. I had to spend $40,000 because I had no insurance when I, when I went inpatient. Right. But I came out better. I said, I'll, I'll deal with it. They'll get the money. They'll get it when they get it. I can't give it to them now. Right. And they know that. (laughs) They know that shit. You think I'm the only person that owes them 40 bands? Like, you know, I was just like, yo, like they can't pull me away. They can't turn me away. So, you know, that was the thing. I was like, yo, don't even worry about that at that moment. Sooner or later, they'll forget about it. Trust me, you'll be fine. I turned it in to tie into what you were saying. I turned it into my career. You know what I mean? I I made a career out out of being truthful with myself and truthful with my story. So for you, though, this is what I always ask uh, people in entertainment and modeling is different. Modeling and acting are like the two things where you can get be like racist and get away with it. <laughs> you know, and, yeah, you know, and, and, and like sizest and like shapest. All of it. All of um, it. They're like, like, hey, we're, we're, hey, we're casting a role of like a tall, fat black woman <laughs> who's like really sassy. <laughs> and then they'll put this racist ass fucking ad agent ad out there, and then like four hundred people will show up. That's the craziest yep. thing to me. It's like, hey man, we're looking for like a really like skinny, hundred ten pound, five ten, green eyed white woman mm-hmm. to walk in this thing. I don't understand. I, I think uh, you would know better than me. You're in it. Is it is it a little more inclusive than when you started? I would hope. Um, I would say I joined modeling at the cusp of it transitioning into a more inclusive environment. So like, for example, I won Sports Illustrated um, model search two years after Camille. Um, Got it. We were already in the wave of inclusivity. For me, what was significant about it is that we were also going into hair inclusivity. Because when I was first Uh. applying after I won, I was coming in like this with straight hair. Right. They're like, you have an afro. I'm like, yeah. They're like, we don't want this wig. Where your afro out? I was like, are you sure? They're like, yeah. And that's like, oh, that's kind of lit. Yeah. yeah. But um, that also comes with the fact that not, unfortunately, even in today's age, they're still hiring hairstylists who don't know how to work with my hair. So actually, two years ago, um, right before the pandemic, actually, um, I had a photo shoot. This guy who was very experienced, he was black, actually, did my hair. Heat damage is so bad. It was the first time I had put heat on my natural hair since shaving my head off, shaving my head. Yeah. Um, and my hair never reverted back. So I spent most of the pandemic regrowing out my afro. You know, so what? there's still situations like that. I would have sued the fuck out of them. I wish. I want to put insurance on my hair. <laughs> you should. You should. I tell people all the time. Listen, if it helps, makes you money, insure it. Insure it. Yeah. Because this is what people got to understand, right? We're all in the entertainment business because we want to, we all have a a look at me inside of us. Look at me. You know, it's like, hey, you get to look at me, but I get to entertain you. So that's the trade off, right? Like, you want to see me. I want to get paid. So let's do this transaction and let's all have fun together and and make make it a thing. The transparency in entertainment just needs to get there. So for you, though, you actually had to do your own hair, right? Most times I do. I'll come to set with my hair already done. Do you? Is that because like you're you're terrified now, or you just know that most most uh, hairdressers just don't know what to do with you? Um, I make it a point for my agents to send me the full call sheet so I can look up the hairstylist background. And if in their Instagram or on their online portfolio, I don't see a single natural hair girl, I already know what's up. <laughs> Let's say I come out freshly washed, nothing done to it. I'm going to walk to set. I'm going to sit down knowing I look a hot mess at 8 a.m. They're going to do this. Okay, you're done. Yeah. And I'm going to be like, what? Or sometimes what will happen is the client wants me in my Afro, but there's versions of my Afro. You can have it full picked out Angela Davis. Or you can have it where the curls are defined. Most times they want the curls defined. And a lot of hairstylists don't know how to do that method. So I just sort of come prepared just for anything. And if worse comes to worse, they can pick it out if they need to. Now, how often do you feel like you have to protect yourself 
in terms of your identity when it comes to you know like we were talking about like hey like we need like this type of person and it's like are they are they subjecting me or is this something you know do you have to go through is that a dialogue that plays out in your head no not for me because i think i have established a really good relationship with my agents so they know what i will or won't do what are my boundaries uh, you know things like that um so I, luckily i don't have to be in the weeds of those conversations but like for example there's been a couple times where my agent sent me a um uh, a submission for a hair brand a famous hair brand who wants a natural hair girl and they want to dye her hair either red or purple and i was like and it's the money is amazing but i'm like Okay, once they, d I have a very unique hair shade. It's like a light brown with a bit blonder in the front. So like you can't recreate it. So I'm like, well, if this is the case, are they dyeing my hair back after? Like, are they gonna pay for my salon fee to go and get it undone? Yeah. Otherwise, I I'm not paying that. <laughs> yeah, listen, listen, for men uh, listening to this, just so you guys know, uh, when any woman goes into a salon, it's a hundred off top, easy. That, and that's the the lowest 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 for a black woman double that gosh as the baseline i feel about white women with braids as a person with a tender scalp i just think i'm sorry because their hair is gonna fall. <laughs> i don't know if you've seen on tiktok the like i've, seen it. Of I've seen it i've seen them they don't I've believe it's true yeah, you know, that's fine. Sometimes you have to learn the hard way. Go ahead. I mean, at the end of the day, you can wear braids if you want to. I have one of my best friends is Filipina. She she did box braids one time. Fine. Do you. But at the end of the right. day, also don't start complaining or bashing box braids when your hair is falling out because your hair is not coarse enough or strong enough to hold, to hold on to down. the weight of that braid. Also, remember, when you have braids, you're not just letting them sit there. You're oiling your scalp, making sure everything is okay, wrapping your hair at night. They usually omit that too, which then facilitates the falling out of your hair even more. So I follow a few hair pages and girls will, and you know, when they share videos like that, girls will be arguing back and forth, even hairstylists arguing back and forth. But it's like, the fact of the matter is, it's not that we don't want you to have it. Enjoy your life, do what you want to do with your body. We're just trying to inform you and make you more educated educated about the fact yeah, that it's not going to go the way you think it is yeah for your hair type you have much more risk of going bald hey listen you heard it here first you know what i mean thank god i'm 34 i still have my hair but i have my yeah. beanie on because i have my i have my hat hair so i was hiding it you spoke to a guidance counselor though right at, at one point in your life do you do you still keep in contact with this guidance counselor at all no because that guidance counselor did something very foul i learned later on oh so, you have you have one of those too have, huh? yeah i have a you got one of those too oh uh, yeah <laughs> i know exactly what you're talking about not, <laughs> exactly. to say, not to say that guidance counselors are bad mine obviously helped me oh no yeah but um no oh, yeah. i do not I, when i really when i tell you i left connecticut i left and cut every tie for the most part <laughs> I really, unless we're Facebook friends. Isn't it so weird though how like a person can be like, you know, like what they did, it was a bad thing. Like it's a bad person, right? But it's like, oh, but they kind of helped me though. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that hard? It's like, damn, like that kind of sucks. You know what I mean? I'm like, damn, that shit is kind of fucked up. Yeah. I had a I had a vice principal get in some trouble for some weird shit. And uh he used to be really nice to me. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. And uh, yeah, and then we found out a couple of years later, and then I was watching the news. And I go, oh yeah, all of that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, I said, you know what? All that makes sense. All that makes sense. So, uh, all right, listen. So about being uh, uh, a Sports Illustrated rookie, right? What about what are the nerves? What are your thoughts when you're in there? Because are you guys all taking pictures? Like, all right, who's next? All right, you're next. Like, or, or do you guys all have like your own separate shoots? Yeah, we have our separate shoots. So usually they'll shoot, I want to say between three and five girls at a time at a location. So like one week they'll be in Barbados, the next week they're in Turks and Caicos, the next week they're in Europe somewhere, you know, they spread it out. Um, and usually what happens is a model has one day to herself for pho photography and one day to herself for the vi uh, videography and like the adventure time that they usually do. 
So okay. for last year, my last, my third year in it, um, we went to Barbados. Um, I shot all day from sun up to sundown, literally. You wake up at 5 a.m. You're not done until like 8 p.m. Um, enjoyed time with the team, got dinner, woke up the next day, did my activation. I played cricket and then one other ball game. But it was awesome. Uh, they even made me eat crickets. <laughs> I've ate crickets before, too. They're not terrible. They're not bad. But it's not it's not the worst thing. It, it, it's yeah. like almost like a like a like a chip almost if they yeah. if they're fried. It's not it's not terrible. Yeah. Or like an overly cooked piece of bacon. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're not that bad. They're not that bad. But <laughs> so you're there with like three or four other models though? Uh yes. Usually they don't tell you who though. Like they're very quiet on who's shooting cuz sometimes it could be a celebrity or you know something else that they have uh. to yeah, okay. but um, usually if you're like past each other in the halls of the hotel, you're like, oh my god, god hey! Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Or like you see the call sheet and it's like, okay, today's shooting Monday, Sarah's shooting Tuesday, so then I'll be like, oh, okay, she's in this year's issue. All right, but how much in like the back of your mind you're like, oh hey, what's up? It's like I'm fucking beat you, bitch. I'm gonna beat you. <laughs> no, never <laughs> honestly. Um, I would say that being a sports illustrated model is almost like a, a sorority of sorts. Like once you're in there's just this community. Like you immediately just love each uh, other. I, I can positively say that's probably one of my favorite things about Sports Illustrated. Like even if, let's say they don't bring me back for a fourth year, no harm, no foul, because I still have so much love from everybody, from the team and the models. Yeah. And sometimes they bring you back, like you may skip two years and then they bring you back again. Like it's just never ending. You just never Well, you've done it three years in a row, right? Yes. Which one was your favorite shoot? Barbados. Barbados, Barbados. Okay, so- Here's another thing, another uh, stigma that we're going to break too. People think model, right? Especially men. Men think model. And what do we think? They're hot and dumb. Yes. <laughs> you said it. I didn't say it. I'm not, I'm not going to get canceled. So Maryland, and then you get your master's at Georgetown. Okay. Let me tell you guys something. People have to understand this is why we, we break stigmas on the show we break down barriers on this show all right new york's prices is actually why i deeply consider moving back to maryland like next week yeah why not you get, this well, is what covid people gotta take this thing from covid and understand it all right you don't need to live in new york city anymore you don't you don't however as a model um whose majority of our client base is based in new york that at one point during the pandemic, I was commuting back and forth from Maryland to New York just for a 15 minute casting. It, it was be like it was, that sometimes though. It was hard. It, it wasn't worth it. So I told myself, I'll give myself at least one more year and then I'll either consider LA or I'll go back to the DMV. But um, New York definitely has left her mark on me in probably the worst way. <laughs> you want to know what it is? The, 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 you know, you know, you're finally from New York and lived in New York enough when you're like, you wake up. And you're just like, I fucking hate this place, but you love it. <laughs> you know, it's like this fucking place sucks. Right. I, love, I when, love it. I went back to Maryland for homecoming a couple of weeks ago. And when I was back down there, I was like, I miss New York. <laughs> yeah, it's the truth. It's it, it, New York has like a everyone's relationship with New York is toxic. It's the most toxic place to live. Because you just can't leave it. You know, it's terrible for you. It's not, it's, you know, it's, yeah, it has its benefits. But at the end of the day, it's like, this thing took more of me than I took of it. Yeah. You leave parts of your soul here. Yes. Yes. Because parts of your soul die here. <laughs> this, is people, this is where people like for dreams to come true. But also think about like how many people's dreams die here. Die here, yeah. They left. That's like. You know, like that's something that I always think about. It's like, dude, if you could make it, it's so corny, but like they say, like, if you could make it here, you can make it anywhere. It's kind of true. It's very true. Cause it, it's kind of true. Will build you tough. And that shit will humble the fucking shit out of you. Like yeah. anytime I think I ever like have any kind of money, I just look at apartments that people own like brownstones. And I'm like, yeah, I got to work harder. <laughs> They showed like the lady, like the uh, Corcoran lady, they, yep. like, you know, those videos where it's like, hey, what's up? Like, yo, where do you live? Can I see you? How much do you pay? Like those fucking yep. TikToks. I was like, yo, this lady's got an $80 million condo. And that's one of her spots. 
Mm-hmm. Got to work bedroom. harder, and it's a two bedroom. Yeah, mm-hmm. we got to do more. We got to yep. do more. I'm telling <laughs> you, it's the the grind never stops. If you're a 1099, it's 1090 grind. That's all it is, because it never it never ends. Um, I love it. <laughs> Yeah, it's 1090 grind season. That's it. That's what people have to understand. You could use it. But I'm just telling you, this is how it is. Everybody has to understand. Um, Another thing that I want to um, just express to you, obviously, we're so thankful to have people of of all walks of life on the show. But I really think that when we have people of color on the show, it's a really big deal for us because... You know, I'm I'm half Puerto Rican, half Italian. So like I saw like racism inside my own family, which was like kind of crazy. And it's like, you know, the racism that I dealt with is not the same racism that black people deal with. I always say the people, the person that has it worse, worse in America in, in the history of the entire world are black women. Mm-hmm. Because even if you look back at like you know, you see a lot of a, a great black men like did things, right? It's like, but usually though, like they had a woman on the side. You know what I mean? Like they they, they were doing other shit. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, the, the black woman is the most uh, suppressed, oppressed, fucking depressed, probably people, people, any pressed is black women. So- you know, I hope that you do take time. You know, it, it's something that I'll never be able to understand, but it's something that I, I that I try to be able to show as much compassion as possible, because historically, it's been kind of a rough run for you guys. Just a little bit. <laughs> just just a little bit. Now, and still- how and and yeah, and still now, how much of that, you know especially like what you're doing for the mental health with women, but how much of that plays a role in what you do daily? Like, uh, do do you, cause you know, you're educated. So you've done, you've done all the reading you've done, you've done the history. What advice would you have for young women of color, especially black women Mm -hmm. in the modeling industry, which has been known to be a racist industry. I I'm, 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 I, you know, Entertainment industry is racist. You know, we've, you know, always will be for those that are, that want to do it. What words of advice do you have for people that are up and coming, want to be up and coming the younger generation? uh, I call them, uh, you know, the, the hopelessly uh, hopeless, uh, you know? Yeah. I would say um, be open, but be guarded. Be open to new experiences, Mm. opportunities. Do your best to say yes at every opportunity you get as long as it feels legitimate. Don't just do it stupid and willy-nilly because there's a lot of scammers out here, especially in the industry. Yes. Um, And fucking fucking perverts, too. And perverts, yes. Yes. Um, But in that same breath, also be guarded and smart. Be cognizant. Um, Do your research on everybody, even your agents, the history of your agency. Have they been in any lawsuits? Um, uh, ask around, ask friends, hey, how did you like working with this person or so-and-so? Um, get your bread right because mm. you're going to likely have to pay a lot more than the average other white girl who can get it for free because the photographer has an affliction for white girls where he'll probably charge you $400 for that same exact shoot and you're a better model. Um, don't take Wow, anything that happens? Oh, yes. I, I, I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> Just happened just yesterday. <laughs> yeah, let me tell you something, man. That's it's so true. Everything like you said is just so crazy. It's like we let we let this shit happen. And I'm talking about dudes. We let the we let this shit happen. We let this shit happen, and we let it happen too much. It's it's crazy though. Like you know, and the other and the other thing I wanted to ask though too, like when you're shooting with SI and stuff, do they have mental health professionals there? No. They should have they should have mental health professionals there. You know, they could. And they should, but also I'll say MJ uh, Day, who's the chief editor, she is at every shoot and she is like a comforting mother Teresa. Yeah. She talks to you before the shoot. She touches base with you. She tells every girl, girl, you don't need to lose a single pound. 
eat the burger. That's her one of her her most notable li- lines is eat the burger. Do a yeah. shoot, eat the burger. You know. So I would say that what I really love and was surprised about when I started with Sports Illustrated was the fact that when they mean they're inclusive, they want you for you. They don't want you to tweak yourself at all. Now you can on your own accord, but they will never encourage you to do anything outside of the way you came to them. Um, and so when I go on to set, I feel so safe. It's, I think mm. that's why it's my favorite shoot to work on because I just feel so safe. Everybody feels so safe. Everyone feels like family. It sounds so cliche, um, but it's just pressure. There's no pressure except for to you to just have fun, enjoy it. And if there's something that's bothering you, it'll be fixed instantly. Just yeah. The Which is How rare. It's yeah, that, I'm, I'm sure that's rare because most of those people, they have a job to do and they're like, why can't you just do what we want you to do? Yeah, yeah. Not Almost. not even caring about what you're going through. They're like, oh, like uh, we need this picture. We need this. We need this. Like uh, lighting and all this shit. It's like, dude, I'm having a fucking nervous breakdown here. Right. Like I don't give um, a fuck about lying about this. Uh, that I'm happy in Barbados right now. I can't breathe. Yeah, exactly. Most shoots, uh, you're just a walking mannequin. Like trying the clothes, shoot. Next look, shoot. Next look, shoot. On with SI, they want to feel and hear your personality. So mm. they want to. They, they want you to feel comfortable enough to just be you, which I and there's a reason. There's a reason why they've been around so long. Exactly. Nobody buys magazines anymore. Everyone buys that magazine. They do. Everyone buys that magazine, though. <laughs> you know what I mean? No one buys magazines anymore. Everyone buys that one. If you could give your younger self any advice, mm-hmm. what would you what would you say to twelve year old you? Two things. Hold on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. um, and secondly i don't know how to say it without it coming off so aggressive but check all those motherfuckers nice. i was such a pushover and looking back i wish my backbone forms early younger um because there's a few people i can name them i know their first and last name still from elementary yeah, and, school. and you'll never forget them i will never forget them um they should have been checked um, I, I could have easily put them in their place too. It's like, I didn't even try, but, um, I think being shy and just not wanting to have any type of friction with anybody and just wanting to right. please everybody and not be the angry black girl and not ruffle any feathers and just do what I need to do. I could have still done that. But when someone tried me, I wish I could have, you know, corrected them, corrected those actions. I think that definitely would have changed the way I felt about myself, my self-esteem, the way I perceived myself. Um, and I think that also would have perce- changed the way they perceived me. Mm. Okay. That's a bar. You ever check their Instagrams? Oh yeah. <laughs> I do that too. <laughs> their LinkedIn, their Facebook and their Instagram. I'm checking. I'm checking. I said, as long as I'm doing better than you, I'm winning. <laughs> I'm winning. None of them are my DMs. Of course. Really? See, that's how it goes. Oh, remember like when we went to school? I'm like, yeah, I fucking remember you, you motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, I remember you, bitch. Yeah, you fucking <laughs> bitch. I remember you. Um, the And uh, the last question, though, is when was the first moment when you were like, holy shit, this is my life? Because as entertainers, we're always like, it's on to the next thing. We, we don't really stop and smell the roses too much. It's like, all right, I did that. Now I'm on my phone, like, Oh, what's up? All right. Yeah. Let's book this gig. Let's see if I could book this and do that and do all this shit. Yeah. I think the first one was, I've had a lot of them. The first was probably when I finally got into Maryland because I actually took me three times to apply. Um, So that was the first one. I think career wise, the next one would be when I had my own office in my aerospace job. Nice. Like overlooking. Yeah. Oh, this is my shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was nice. Um, and then after that, I would say when I won Sports Illustrated right after I did um the runway show. Uh, now you're like, this shit is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> my, <laughs> like what see, next? <laughs> listen, my dream is to be on a beach in Turks and Caicos one day and in between shoots, someone's just coming up and just like fixing my titties and shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, just like making sure, like wiping fucking sweat off my head and shit. One day, I'm gonna get there. It's my dream. I, it, I can promise you, you can have that next week. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I am going to Turks. I am going to Turks in January, so I might just do my like my own. 
Oh, you're gonna love it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, I bought it's my birthday present to myself. I'm taking my fiance. Oh, happy go birthday! Out to thank you, thank you. Uh, the the older I get, uh, the colder it is outside for some reason when I live in New York. You know, so I was like, you know what? I'm getting the fuck out of here. Mm-hmm. You know, my knees hurt for no reason and shit. Now it's like it's just yeah. old people shit. You know, yeah. just getting old. Um, but listen, I'm so proud to have you on the show and I'm proud of you. Thank you for being so open and, and willing to share your experiences. Um, the last question that I ask everybody on the show is, are you happy today? Yes. Okay. That's all. Yes. That's it. <laughs> I, because I, I was actually I, just in my car thanking God like an hour ago because the apartments I was looking at today are not at the same caliber I could have looked at last year, you know? And is that weird? It's it's crazy. It's crazy how one year can change everything. It's I, crazy. I feel very and I've had a really, really, really hard year. Um, in August, I actually tried to take my life yet again. Um, so it's been wow. Uh, yes, it's been quite Whoa. some. <laughs> just drop that bomb at the end <laughs> yeah yeah no we're gonna need uh, another another minute an- another minute here um yeah. <laughs> so, so so just so what what have you been diagnosed with um depression okay depression. Just, uh, do you have like manic depression like manic depression or you just have severe severe depression i'm actually not too sure um that's not my to-do list to do because when i was admitted to the psych ward um late august um, which one uh it was at one of the hospitals K- kala something uh Cal- i went to Len- i went to lennox hill hospital so i was saying i was like yeah oh, okay yeah it was somewhere I was in brooklyn graduating class you know what i mean so just make <laughs> sure yeah <laughs> um they had referred me to another doctor but at the time i did not have insurance so i was like i'm gonna put this off um but yeah essentially um i was at probably the lowest i've been since 12 years old Um, I had texted a girlfriend of mine who lives in Florida, who's one of my best friends. And I told her, um, I can't do this anymore. You know, I love you. And then she texted one of our mutual, really good friends who lives here, but she was actually in DC. So then she called the police. So by the time I was about to do the do, um, I heard her banging on my door. Um, and 10 ER people came in, you know, took down all my information, took photos of the scene, yeah. you know, all that stuff. And I thought it was funny that you mentioned like health insurance is because one of the things they said was you need to come into the ambulance. And I was like, I can't afford <laughs> an ambulance. Yeah. They're like, don't worry about it. We'll handle that later. You can pay a dollar a day if you need to, but like, this is important right now. We need to get you to the hospital. Um, so situations like that, but, um, I'm very thankful. I, I call, you know, my, my girlfriend, Jasmine, my lifesaver is her birthday last week, actually. So in the birthday card to her, I literally call her my angel. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a really, really hard year on every front from tensions with my family, financial tension, career, not, not, not really sure what I'm doing in this life or does it matter, you know? So, uh, it was really hard but um like i said you're here here, though i'm here i'm happier than ever um i feel much more stable and with all the resources i have now i'm just ready to be my best self and listen you you need to tell your story how you want to tell it when you want to tell it and let me tell you something we're so happy that you're here everyone listening thank we're thankful for you to be here i'm not saying on the show i'm saying on the planet you know what I mean? You, you're you're going to impact people with this episode. You've impacted me. You've changed my day. So the thing that you were talking about, one person, you got me already. So <laughs> that I hope I, I'm being serious. I'm not just saying that. I'm Thank being you. serious. You've you changed the way I looked at my day today. So like I'm 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 gonna live it up after this. You know, <laughs> like I'm gonna text my mom. I'm gonna text my dad. Like you know what I mean? Like I'm telling you, you're 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 beautiful, right? You're beautiful. And what you need to understand is at times you might not feel that way and it might not, you feel like everything else doesn't like, uh, I I can only speak from my experience. I felt like a failure so many times in my life. 
I felt like such a fucking loser, just a like, like a nothing person, you know, yeah. like I don't add any benefit to my own life. So I can't benefit other people's lives. I can't do that. Depression has a way of speaking to you in ways that are just not true. So in the moments when you were in a good place, you need to speak to yourself positively. You need to speak about your life positively. You need to face things head on. I used to run from shit and it only got worse, worse and worse and worse. If I owed a bill, I ran from it. it got worse and worse and worse and worse. <laughs> if I hurt my leg, I didn't help it. Worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah. <laughs> I was the, that's just how I, that's how I was. I was an avoider. I, I was a master of avoidance and it weighed on my conscience. It weighed on my conscience so much that I would look around and be like, I'm a disaster of a person. But we all have these periods in our time. There have been times, there was a time like five months ago, I said, you know what? It'd be, you know, it'd be dope if I just jumped in front of this train. You know, and it's like, and that's a normal thought to have sometimes. It's a normal thought to have sometimes. It's like, yeah, I wonder if I jumped in front of this train, if that shit would like, would do the job. Yeah. You know what I mean? And every time I've thought about hurting myself and, and taking my own life, I have this little voice that goes off in my head that I haven't been diagnosed with, but you know, I have a little thing that goes off in my head. I'm like, dude, you're going to ruin so many lives off, off of this decision. Right. So before you do it, you have to make sure that you have to go and get the best help that you can get. Cause I tell you, I tell people all the time, therapy, the sessions are fantastic. You have to do the homework. You have to do the homework because listen, today, if you tell yourself that you're a loser a hundred times a day, your brain isn't smart enough to not know if you're kidding or not. Subconsciously, right. subconsciously you're going to start thinking you're a loser and you're not. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. you have to have a you, the biggest things I'm working on is talking to myself nicer because yes. all the things like, you're a failure. You're a nobody. What are you doing? You're, just, you're stupid. You know, all of that. I, I say it too often to myself. Meanwhile, oh. Anybody, who, even strangers on the street, I will speak so much life into them. You're beautiful. Oh, you're such a wonderful spirit. Like God's covering you, all this stuff. But it's like, why can't I give myself that same love and grace back? It's because at times we don't love ourselves, mm -hmm. but we always love other people. That's the biggest problem with, it's one of the biggest uh, things that I've noticed with people who suffer from depression like us is we'll go out of our way to make your day in a way that helps us deal with what we're dealing with for that moment in time. But it's the yeah. times when we're home alone and we're on Instagram or we're checking our bank statement or we're looking at comparing ourselves to other people's lives, you know, and, you know, it's different for women, but women start thinking about their age, their body is way, it's way different for women. Um, you know, their looks, why can't I do this? I should have done this. I should have done that. And that's the stuff that kills you. That's the stuff that will kill you. You know, it's, you have to understand that, you know, and this is something I struggle with every day too. I don't have all the answers, but just in your sense, in your case, just know I've been there and I've noticed that I've tricked my brain into actually thinking I was a loser mm -hmm. and that, I, and that I was not even worthy to be uh, alive anymore, but it's not the case. I'm telling you, if you practice just talking to yourself in a positive manner, you really, really have to love yourself more and more every day because one, it's infectious. When people see that you love yourself, it, it's infectious. People understand, you know, but I tell everybody at the end of the day, we go to sleep by ourselves. We have our own brains. We're not connected to anything. The human body is, is God's most amazing creation of all time. Yeah. We're the, we are the iPhone, you know, we are, that's just like what we are. We, that's really what we are, but like all machines, machines need maintenance. Yes. You know, machines need updates, mm -hmm. software updates, firmware updates. We have to do that ourselves on a daily basis. So, you know, I'm so happy you're here. I, I'm trying not to cry. So I'm talking <laughs> a lot. You know what I mean? I'm trying not to cry. But I'm just telling you, I'm so proud of you. And I just met you today. You know, I, I'm going to always be proud of you. I'm going to be thinking about you. I'm going to be checking in on you. 
And this is something that I want you to just take from this conversation. Anybody here at what we do at Off the Cuff, we have we have connections with everybody. If you ever need help, you holler at us. You ever need to talk to somebody, we have people that do that too. We care about you. You're a member of our community now. You're a member of our family. We love you. And I want you to know that you got this. You got this. You got this. But you have to say it. I got this. You got this. <laughs> All right. And we yeah, can't let those motherfuckers from middle school win. No, we can't. <laughs> no. Fuck them. It's not I'm gonna over. Keep, I'm ready to shine and I'm ready to grind. 1090 grinds. Yeah. We got 1090 it. 1090 grind. 1090 grind. And, and uh, you listen, you're going to find the right apartment. You're going to find what it is you got to do. I, I trust me. Uh, trust me. Trust me. You got this. You got this. Thank you. Okay. And, and I'm so proud of you. And I'm so proud of your strength that you're here. And I'm so proud that you were willing to say that. You're not going to make me cry. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, I don't want you to cry. I'm so you're proud crying. that you're here. I'm so proud that you're here and that you have the balls, the balls. No one has bigger balls than women. Women <laughs> have the biggest balls. All right. If I offend anybody with that, sorry, cancel me. But what I said is to talk about that on this show like that, something that new to you is a very strong thing to do. And you're going to save somebody's life with that. You 100%. So I appreciate your candidness. I, 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 I appreciate your transparency. We are fucking rooting for you all right you so go out there and crush it crush that shit <laughs> thank you i'm going to where can everybody find you on the internet you can find me at tanae dubs everywhere t-a-n-a-y-e-d-u-b-z got it and then you know listen stay in touch i'm gonna be checking in on you now we'll do man i'm about to follow you back once we get off i got you 